The Art of Empire, Section 1, on War, Section 1A, The Four Types of Army. An army comprised of loyal volunteers, who are also well cared for, is invincible. An army comprised of loyal volunteers, who are not well cared for, will win with losses. An army comprised of drafted conscripts, who are well cared for, can win with losses. An army comprised of drafted conscripts, who are not well cared for, is already lost. By not caring for an army of loyal volunteers, one's soldiers will be reduced to slaves. Loyal volunteers fight to be victorious. Drafted conscripts fight to survive. Slaves will fight only for their freedom. Section 1B The Six Types of Soldier Section 1 B A Slaves There are two types of slaves. One, one type of slave is not well cared for. This type of slave is worthless as a worker. This type of slave will spy on their master and sell their knowledge to their master's enemy. This type of slave will revolt with ten times the strength they exhibit at work against their master as soon as the opportunity to do so with assured success arises. This type of slave will see freedom as necessary to survival. 2. The other type of slave is well cared for. This second type of slave is especially skilled. This type of slave will serve their master unless promised freedom by their master's enemy. This type of slave will revolt only with the same amount of force with which they have been punished by their master. If the master is punitive, the slave will be encouraged to revolt. If the master rewards the slave, the slave will serve proudly. This type of slave prefers immediate survival to the promise of freedom. Section 1B B. Conscripts There are two types of drafted conscripts. 3. The first type of drafted conscript is a well cared for slave. A well cared for slave will fight willingly for two reasons the promise of freedom from slavery, or the expansion of their rights while remaining slaves. Of these two reasons, the former will motivate a slave who is punished more than rewarded, and the latter will motivate a slave who is rewarded more than punished. Well cared for slaves who fight willingly for their rights, if they are well cared for as an army, will win with losses against an army of loyal volunteers who are not well cared for. Well cared for slaves who fight for the promise of freedom will lose to an uncared for army of loyal volunteers fighting for rights. 4. The second type of drafted conscript is a citizen. Of citizens who can become drafted conscripts to form an army, there are two types. The first are citizens of the nation into whose army they are conscripted. The second are citizens of another nation than the one into whose army they are conscripted. If a citizen is conscripted by draft into their own nation's army, they will fight for the reason of their own personal survival. If they are promised additional rights as the goal of victory, they will fight to be victorious. If a citizen is conscripted by another nation than their own, they will fight to be victorious if they are promised freedom, but will only fight their own nation to survive. 
Section 1B C Volunteers There are two types of loyal volunteer. 5. One type fights for the expansion of their own rights. If a loyal citizen is promised additional personal rights for volunteering to their national army, they will fight for their own survival, because acquiring their additional rights depends on survival. 6. The other type fights for the expansion of the rights of their nation. A loyal volunteer fighting for the expansion of the rights of their nation will fight for the cause alone if well cared for, but will only fight for their own survival if not well cared for. Section 1C The Predictive Art of War The most invincible form of army is one comprised of loyal volunteers who fight to expand the rights of their nation and who are well cared for. Such an army cannot be defeated except in mutual destruction by an equal army. The most easily defeated form of army is one comprised of well cared for slaves who are not well cared for as an army. Such an army is only more effective than an army of conscripts from the enemy nation. An army of alien conscripts fighting their own nation will revolt if not well cared for. An army of uncared for slaves will revolt. By applying these rules to the composition of armies before entering battle, any army can be assigned a rate of probable success or failure against any other, and the outcome of any battle can be predicted before even being entered. The prediction of a battle's most probable outcome before it is entered is the most important form of strategy in the art of war. If a series of battles' outcomes can be accurately predicted, then one can advance through the ranks of the armies whose victory is most likely and can come to establish an empire. Just as the prediction of the outcome of battles is described within the sphere considered the art of war, so is the strategy of applying the accurate predictions made possible by studying this art considered a game of risk. If one applies the art of war in the game of risk, one will quickly conquer all. The ultimate result of the art of war is the ability for one to predict victory in any combat, and the application of this strategy results in one betraying any loyalty presenting an impediment to their own predictions of victory. Such a one as applies the art of war in the game of risk will find themselves among a shrinking group of traitors. Only by stabbing your last friend in the back can a safe empire be assured. Section 2 On Empire Section 2A The Bureaucratic Art of Empire However, once an empire is established by such as one who follows the art of war and who successfully applies its strategies, certain additional rules are necessary to understand for the maintenance of their empire. It is necessary, then, to apply the same rules to one's own loyal populations during a peaceful empire as are used in composing an army. The primary difference is that, while one deals with the compositions of armies to battle enemy nations, one is attempting to maximize the likelihood of victory of their own nation's army over their nation's enemy's army. In point of fact, the opposite is desired to maintain an empire. Rather than a strong army, the goal of empire is a weak population. In order to properly maintain an empire, one must build a population that is least likely to revolt. 
however, one who is also least likely to achieve victory as an army. Therefore, to maintain empire, the population must be separated against one another, much the same way as in the composition of armies. However, instead of an army that can be mobilized against an enemy nation, the preferable form for an empire is a police force that can be utilized against their own national population. The traditional form of empire falls into the shape of a three-tiered triangle. The base tier is comprised of the population of citizens. The second tier, lesser group, is comprised of the national army or police. The third tier, the singular apex of the triangle, is reserved to the minimum possible number of the ruling elite. The composition of the police and the composition of the population must be balanced such that the police can effectively suppress the much larger population of citizens from revolt against the ruling elite. The composition of the police and the population must also be manipulated by the ruling elite such that should the police and citizens combine to revolt against the ruling elite their chances of success will be minimalized. The balance between police and citizens is one of brute force. The balance between the ruling elite and the rest of their population is one of strategy. Section 2b1 The Composition of an Empire A population comprised of well-cared-for slaves and uncared-for citizens is best for an empire. A police force comprised of uncared-for slaves and well-cared-for citizens is best for an empire. A population or police force comprised of well-cared-for slaves and citizens will desire expansion of rights. A population or police force comprised of uncared for slaves and citizens will desire expansion of freedom. If citizens that desire rights combine with a police force that desires freedom, they will revolt against the ruling elite. If citizens that desire freedom revolt, a police force that desires rights will combine with the ruling elite. The ruling elite cannot suppress a revolt by both the citizens and the police. That is why the balance between police and citizens is one of brute force. The ruling elite combined with the police can suppress a revolt by the citizens under certain specific conditions. If the citizens are equal or less in actual numbers to the perceived numbers of combined police and the ruling elite, then the revolt will be suppressed. If the citizens are equal or greater in actual numbers to the perceived numbers of combined police and elite, their revolt will be successful. That is why the manipulation of the population by the elite is one of strategy. If the perceived number of the ruling elite is equal or greater than the actual number of police, the police will side with the ruling elite. If the actual number of the ruling elite is less than the perceived number of police, the citizens will not be successful in a revolt against either. The number of citizens is always greater than that of the police, and the number of police is always greater than that of the ruling elite. It is only by manipulation of one group's perception of the number of another group that revolt can be avoided. It is only by manipulation of police against citizens that the elite can suppress a revolt. In order to assure the success of their empire, 
a hegemon must apply to the composition of their populations. This set of rules, as much so as, in order to assure the victory of their army, a strategist must apply to the composition of their armies the art of war. Just as by applying the art of war, one can win the game of risk and establish an empire. By applying these rules for the composition of their population, one who establishes or inherits such an empire can maintain their empire in safety. Section 2b2 The Maintenance of an Empire To maintain an empire, it is necessary to divide the population between a police force and the remainder of the population. The police force and the rest of the population are both comprised of slaves and citizens. Because it is necessary, the perceived number of police be greater than the actual number of the rest of the population. In order to accomplish this, slaves in the police force are equal in rights to free citizens. Thus, citizen police are actually closer to the ruling elite than are the rest of the population. A citizen in the police force is defined by being a loyal volunteer, while a slave in the police force is defined as being an enemy conscript. The citizen-based police force is equivalent to an army of loyal volunteers. Just as a well-cared-for army of loyal volunteers is invincible in battle, the citizen-based police force is life or death in suppressing a revolt. In order to survive, it is necessary for the ruling elite or hegemon to establish a citizen-based police force greater in perceived number than the actual number of the non-police force population. Thus, well-taken-care-of slaves will side with the citizen-based police force, and so the perceived number of police will be greater than the actual number of citizens. In an empire under such conditions, whereby citizens who serve the role of police are well cared for, where citizens who do not serve the role of police are given less rights, and where well-taken-care-of slaves are more likely to side with the police force than with their masters who are non-police free citizens, the ruling elite will prosper. In an empire under the conditions, however, whereby citizens who serve the role of police are not well cared for, where free citizens are perceived to outnumber the police force, or where slaves, well cared for or not, outnumber in actual number the perceived number of police, the ruling elite will be in peril. Section 2b2a Spies and Revolutions The citizen-based police force, given additional rights to free citizens, and well cared for, can be conscripted to serve the ruling elite in a capacity equivalent to that of an uncared for slave eager to betray their punitive master. This specialized role of the citizen police officer is that of the spy. The perceived number of spies is equal to the actual number of loyal volunteers to the citizen-based police force, even though not all loyal police are spies. This is, ultimately, the most important variable in the entire equation of empire. If the actual number of spies is less than or equal to the actual number of volunteer police, and the actual number of the ruling elite is less than the actual number of spies, the ruling elite will prosper 
most. However, if there is only a slight inequality in either of these cases, to imbalance the equation in the opposite direction, it will allow a successful revolt by the population against the ruling elite. If the actual number of spies were perceived to be less than the actual number of voluntary police, as it actually is, then the balance would be tipped in favor of the population. The slaves would revolt against their masters, the citizens against the police, the slave police against the free, and the free police against the spies, until the spies themselves would revolt against the ruling elite. Each of these naturally outnumbers the next, such that eventually the entire population would side against the ruling elite. The form of revolt in which the entire population sides against the ruling elite is called a revolution. When one ruling elite is overthrown in a successful revolution, a larger actual number ruling elite establishes a new empire. Because the entire mechanism of empire hinges on the single gear defined as the perceived number of spies being greater than or equal to the actual number of free police, it is also this linchpin that must be studied to achieve a successful revolution. Section 2 B. 2. B. Secret Police There are two types of police. Free police, who are loyal volunteers, and slave police, who are drafted conscripts. The actual number of spies is comprised of a fraction of the free police and a fraction of the slave police as well. This is how the perceived number of spies may be maintained as greater than the actual number, and thus how the perceived number of the ruling elite, comprised of the actual number of the ruling elite and the spies, can be maintained as greater than the actual number of the ruling elite, comprised of the actual number of ruling elite and the fraction of spies drawn from the free police. The difference is the actual number of slave police who are spies. If the slave spies side with the citizens, a revolt will be successful. If the slave spies side with the elite, no revolt can succeed. Because of this, for an empire to be maintained, there must be more spies drawn from free police than from slave police. For a conscripted police officer to be made a spy, they must be promised freedom. For a volunteer police officer to be made a spy, they must be promised expanded personal rights. The scale of rights in an empire is therefore opposite the three-tiered triangle designed for the population. The greatest actual number group, slaves, have the least rights, while the smallest perceived number group, the ruling elite, have the most rights. The second greatest actual number group, citizens, have less rights than police, who have less rights than spies, who serve the ruling elite directly. Police have the medium amount of rights, and comprise the medium actual number sized group, this is why spies should come from the free police above the slaves, and why police should come from voluntary free citizens more so than from slaves. If police desire freedom, it is dangerous to the empire. Therefore, the police force is the exact opposite of an army. The army that fights best fights to expand the rights of their own nation. The police force that serves best uses brute force to limit the rights of its nation's citizens. Thus citizens are made the slaves of the police, police the servants of spies, 
and spies the actual rulers behind a hegemon. This will only appear complex to the common citizen due to the manipulation of their perception by spies. They have been convinced that there are no slaves because we are all equally capable of earning money. They have been convinced that having money will give them rights expanded as much as those of the police. They have been convinced that spies and police serve the best interests of the population. Most insidiously, they have been convinced they do not even presently live in an empire. Section 2C The Current Empire An empire is defined by a strong police force, a weak population, a high perceived number of spies, and small actual number ruling elite as well as a weak or absent army defending the personal rights of their nation's own citizens. However, there exists no industrial nation at this time that does not fit this definition. In fact, it is widely accepted by the citizens of all nations that the art of war was long ago applied to the game of risk and that the current ruling elite are comprised of traitors to the populations of their own nations who rule internationally now. These elite are simply called the rich, while the population of their empire are collectively known relative to their rulers as the poor. This is because the strategy of money has been victorious over the brute force of armies and police. Because the elite, through spies, claim to have almost all of the money, the remainder of the populations of all nations are made to desire and to serve that money. They are told that money means survival and that work brings freedom. But such concepts are contradictions and impossibilities of fiction. Therefore, although we are told by spies who serve the elite that we live in nations and that the armies of those nations are at war with one another, the majority of the population realizes that we are all united in poverty caused by the rumors of such international wars, but that because no nations exist, no wars between them are possible. Instead, we understand war as the elite sending two groups of the population to kill one another. Therefore, where there are no nations, no wars, and no wealth, there is revealed only the true conditions of our present reality. The ruling elite, their spies, and the police who oppress money slaves. All serve to gain the promise of wealth which they themselves will never actually possess. Until the population of citizens realizes that, relative to police, they have the same rights as slaves do relative to citizens, there will not be a revolution. Just as slaves fear free citizens, the citizens who fear the police will remain slaves to their own luxury. So long as citizens fear police, police enjoy expanded rights to those of citizens. So long as this continues to be the case, the current empire will persist. Section 3 on hegemony. Section 3a Imperialism's Cause. Section 3a 1 Inner Bipolar Dualism. Ultimately, the philosophy idealizing imperialism is a condition of simultaneous duality resulting in bilocation of one's focus between opposite conflicting concepts. The bicamerality of the cerebrum allows such dualism to be mimicked in the psyche as cognitive dissonance over concepts such as good and evil. 
When a mind begins to think in terms of absolutes, of extreme opposites, it will divide its own potential for expansion against itself in a manner that will shrink its capacity. This method of calisthenic friction is what causes the effect of consciousness to exist initially, the spark that fuels the flame of ego. However, when dwelt in too long, rather than grown beyond, such a bipolar mindset will eventually oscillate between manic or depressed emotions, inspired or distracted cognitions, creative or destructive activities, and sadistic or masochistic impulses. When dwelt upon, the apparently paradoxical simultaneous existence of opposite conditions in nature, such as light and dark, hot and cold, day and night, black and white, etc., will prolong the psychic symptoms of bipolarity, being the self-imposed disease of an introverted ego. Outside of such a bipolar type of mind, the idea of an empire would never have come up, and mankind would yet, even now, remain in the more psychically awake, less technologically developed condition we dwelt in prior to our discovery of and first attempts at what we now call civilization. During the early Paleolithic, when different tribes began to be forced to share space in the same caves due to the lengthening of winters at the beginning of the most recent North Hemisphere Ice Age, this bipolar mind state in our species' first potential hegemons originally arose. The idea of how to convince other tribes to share space comfortably led to the inevitable conclusion of formulating and enforcing a plan to influence them toward doing so. This idea, taken to its ultimate conclusion, is an empire, and the person who embraces such would be its hegemon. The mind of one who would be a hegemon of their own empire is, by its own definition, locked by itself into a dual-cell prison. The mental condition of bipolar extremism that exploits as resources the dualisms in nature and which arises from the split nature of the twin halves of our own species' brains. Thus, all empire symbolizes the redoubling of this initial dualism. That is why empire hinges on even numbers, while a true democracy where government is decentralized into a pluralism, legality is unenforced or non-authoritarian, and all individuals' freedom is maximized. Depends on having a government based on odd numbers. Any even number may be split evenly into two equal parts. Any odd number cannot. To expand exponentially, that is, gradually yet perpetually, rather than asymptotically. An empire's government must be balanced in exact equity, in accord with the bipolarity of the mind of the hegemon. The most stable and longest-lasting empires expand exponentially. Section 3A2 Outer Exponential Dialectics to study this effect of exponential expansion by perpetual doubling, we begin by examining the rule of four that arises between the foundation level, inner bipolarity, and the next iteration of greater sum, outer dualities. Because bipolarity is a condition of cognitive consciousness, and a hegemon is a sociological archetype, we cannot say the two are entirely one and the same. There are those who are both, as well as those who are neither, as well as those who are only one or the other. Hence, the Law of Four arises, presented as the four-part yin-yang, or black-and-white six-over-nine logo, where each opposed side contains its opposite within its own core also. To study the impact of perpetually doubling the original idea of a bipolar hegemon into an actual empire, we thus return to this technique of seeing good, opposite evil, 
yet each containing the other as well, such that within good there is evil, and such that within evil there is good. By fracturing each half of the mirrored reflections, a hologrammatical cellular division occurs alike meiosis. When a single cell divides first into two, then next into four, and continues dividing itself within by multiplying the numbers of its constituent components, thus to eight, then sixteen, etc., by perpetually doubling. This mimetic meiosis results, at first, in the rule of four. To study the social impact of an empire itself, being expanded by such a method, we must then return again to applying to sociology this rule of four, where there is good within evil and evil within good, as well as only both good and evil alone, where there are those who are both or neither, as well as only one or the other, and where any group, if opposed to another, will eventually be infiltrated and subverted from within to merge its motives towards those of the opposed group, until eventually dialectical synthesis between both is achieved. Dialectical synthesis, usually modeled as a triangle with angles labeled thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, if expanded into a tetrahedron by including the operant observer's objective point of view on the process, is the same as the rule of four. The only added component would be to expand the triangle into a tetrahedron by extending its midpoint into the extra-temporal dimension of individual perspective over history. Then, in addition to a good thesis, an evil antithesis, and a synthesis, both, there would also be the option for the otherwise absent point of view of neutral, neither. Section 3b Four Imperial Fours. Section 3b-1. The Four Ways Empires Begin. The idea of empire begins in the bipolar mind of any would-be hegemon. Any individual, bipolar would-be hegemon or not, can, thus, first encounter this idea of empire's pre-existence to themselves in one of two ways. They can formulate this conclusion for themselves on their own, or they may be introduced to it first in the exterior world. Thus, bipolar would be hegemon or not, and the duality of interior or exterior, origins for one's encountering the imperialist idea, combined to form the four conditions for the origination of any empire by attracting other people into a group society. One can originate the idea of empire on their own either within an existing empire or within a free society. Or one can live in a free society and only study empire until their society is conquered by empire or changed into it from within. Or, lastly, one can learn of the meaning of empire by living in one that already exists. Once an empire has been established by an individual who is both bipolar and hegemonic, it will continue to expand exponentially until stopped by an outside force because it feeds on its own hunger and expands itself by creating opposition. If any empire established by a bipolar hegemon is not stopped through opposition from beyond it by a monolithic greater force, any form of government established for such an empire will usually be able to continue to survive, thrive, and prosper even after the death of its founder. In this sense, through the concept of creativity applying the methodology of natural dualisms, such an empire with any form of government would be like itself 
a cancer or virus that doubles by mimetically infecting surrounding minds to inculcate their behaviors into group activities. In this sense, any form of governmental system can be likened to this type of empire, if it shares empire's property of exponential expansion. Thus, any form of evenly balanced, exponentially expanding government has the seed of empire within it. Section 3b2 The Four Types of Empire the four types of empire are 1. The type that is best in terms of greatest amount of gains, both socially in terms of the form of government benefiting the hegemon, and culturally in terms of goods and wealth for the populist community. 2. The type that is worst socially, but best culturally. 3. The type that is best socially but worst culturally. And 4. The type that is worst both socially and culturally. 1. The type of empire that is best both socially and culturally benefits the hegemon above the people equally as much as it benefits the people below the hegemon. There is a strong sense of national defense within the empire, a strong patrol along its border, no rumors of threats from within or without, and a strong economy based on prosperity being attained by combinations of saving, trading, and earning. This sort of empire, because it is prosperous, is often not considered an empire by its citizens, although it does support as a figurehead a non-elected authoritarian hegemon. In such an empire, it is possible for the idea of democracy to generate and flourish in opposition or complementarity to the existence of the hegemony. If the hegemon is wise, they will encourage democracy to preserve the peace, if the hegemon is unwise, they will squander the empire's wealth on excesses of welfare or war. Any empire that can become a democracy is exonerated as being good, compared to any democracy that becomes an empire, seen historically as inherently evil. 2. The type of empire that is worst socially, but also best culturally, is considered a democratic form of an empire. In a democratic type empire, there remains a single hegemon attached to the democratic wing of the state's government, entitled alone. The right of the hegemon to dictate governmental form and set its policies atrophies until lastly it is erased. In this form of an empire, only a minority know they are living in an empire and these minority are in the democratic wing of the imperial state's government. The majority of the population benefit more than this minority in terms of per capita income, and thus the minority who comprise the democratic imperial wing of their empire's government become a shrinking personality cult centered around a bipolar hegemon. Such an empire is prosperous for its populace, but they consider it an empire in name only. A sudden war from outside, or rumors of such a war coming, spread by dissidents within, will function as a pivot point for whether such an empire can continue to prosper, or if it will become destabilized. 3. The type of empire that is best socially, but also worst culturally, is considered a republic form of an empire. In a republican empire, there can remain a single hegemon over the entire governmental system of the state. However, it is also necessarily requisite for there to be a democratic wing of the government attached to the machine of the state that will, supposedly, whether accomplishing it or not, 
influence the hegemon's dictates on behalf of the populations of their empire. In this form of an empire, the majority of the population know they live in an empire, but a minority remain unaware of their surroundings even being considered such. This minority should benefit most among the population from the redistribution by the hegemon of the empire's wealth. Because it is best for the hegemon in such a republican form of empire when this rich minority controls the democratic wing of the government. For the type of empire that is worst both socially and culturally benefits neither the hegemon nor their empire. In such a failing empire, we find plagues, famines, wars and rumors of wars, riots and natural disasters have crippled the empire's ability to expand. Any empire that stymies long is doomed. Any empire that cannot sustain expansion stymies. Any empire that benefits either the hegemon of the state or the populations of the empire more than the other for too long without rebalancing by the pendulum swinging back the other way risks a revolution. Any empire that reaches such a plateau is doomed if the hegemon remains bipolar and it will degenerate into forgotten dust. Any empire that reaches such a plateau is salvaged only by adapting to populist calls for pro-democratic government reform. Section 3b3 The Four Ways Empires End The four ways an empire can be brought down are 1. By prolonged foreign war expenses or rumors of foreign invasion spread by dissidents within the populace. 2. By overinflation of a credit debit bubble economy based on fiat or only apparent economic prosperity. 3. By riots and pro-democratic reform populist movements eroding confidence in their empire's system of government and or the hegemon personally. 4. By the death in office or removal from it by armed forces of the hegemon personally. It is because of these four causes, most of which occur in combination with one or more of the others, by the Empire's ultimate conclusion, that there are said to be four horsemen who appear when the world ends. The horsemen of war, of famine, of disease, and of death. 1. An empire that has a strong economy, but does not have a standing military, is best, both socially and culturally, because even if it has no democratic wing of its government, none of its citizens ever consider their surroundings as an oppressive authoritarian dictatorship. This form of empire can end by becoming a democracy. 2. An empire that has a weak economy and a non-existent military force is the result of pro-democratic reforms that weaken the right to authoritarian dictatorship by the hegemon. Such a democratic empire is an empire in name only, for it retains a hegemon attached to a democratic wing of the government but the hegemon personally is bipolar and exerts no control over the democratic wing. This form of empire would end in a foreign invasion, or can be reformed into a democracy through populist movements by citizens. 3. An empire that has a strong economy and a strong military both is best for a republican form of empire where government is run by a rich elite, personality cult, 
surrounding the hegemony. This form of empire will end in citizen riots from within, and they will eventually adapt to foreign cultures. Following a period of being reduced to dust, the population can re-arise to establish a democracy. 4. An empire that has a weak economy, but has a powerfully armed military, is worst both socially and culturally, because it has no democratic wing of its government, and all of its citizens consider their surroundings as an oppressive authoritarian dictatorship. Such an empire will end in a rioting population, and its memory be reduced to ash. Section 3b-4 the four types of hegemon. Because there are four manners of realizing the idea of empire's existence, because there are thus four types of empire that can arise as forms of government, because there are thus also four ways an imperial government can dissolve its hegemony. For these reasons, there are, accordingly, also four types of person who can fill the role of an empire's personal hegemon. One is wise. One is smart. One is dumb. And one insane. Thus, in the first type of an empire, it is thought of in the first manner, will come to the first type of ending, and will attract to its hegemony this first type of individual mind state. Likewise, in the second, the second, and so forth and so on. 1. The first type of hegemonic personality conceives on their own of the idea of an empire even though they live in the freest form of culture, and benefit from that. This sort of mind is bipolar, but a genius. They will establish an empire inside any existing democratic government, and then equally seek to depose all other existing forms of government they see as being opposed to their own personal hegemony. Such an individual can only live in a free society or in a state of natural liberty. So they are considered both evil and a genius after their death by history, as well as either a genius or as evil by their peers while they are alive. If they establish, subvert, conquer, or inherit an empire, a person who is both bipolar and very intelligent will be equally considered wise by their own citizens and envied by citizens of other types of government and their personal ideals for their own empire will be considered democratic compared to most others. 2. The second type of hegemonic personality conceives on their own of the idea of an empire but is also a citizen of existing surroundings considered an oppressive authoritarian dictatorship by the majority. This person is intelligent, is not bipolar, and may either belong to a rich elite or to a middle class. Their ideals for how to establish their own hegemony are legal in and in accord with the democratic empire form of government in which they are citizens and thus they are allowed, in some cases encouraged, to rise to achieve a high-ranking office's authority. If an intelligent but not bipolar individual from an economically satisfying level rises within a democratic empire's government, it will be through endorsing that government's status quo. And if such an individual comes to sit on the highest throne and become the hegemon themselves, their goal will be their empire's preservation. 
though they may not think they understand the principles of democracy very well themselves. Such people are considered more likely to be open to pro-democratic reforms to their government if not born into poverty. 3. To the third type of hegemonic personality. The idea of empire was never innate. Instead, it was learned by them while living in a free culture and a more republican society. This sort of hegemon is usually born into the middle class or into poverty. Will claim pro-democratic reforms dangerous new ideas and side with survivalist realism above romantic idealism. This sort of person is, in short, born as chattel into the herd. If they are more likely middle class, it is because their pro-republican empire is not in a foreign war or does not have a standing army. If they are more likely poor, it is because their pro-republican empire is already at war against invasion or has an imbalance of economic development toward militarism. If someone who is middle class in a more prosperous, more pacifist empire learns of the fact they live in an empire, they can attempt to change the system of government from within to suit their own liking. If one who is born poor in a less prosperous, more militarized empire learns they live in an empire, they may only try to change the system of government from outside of it. If such a person of average or just below average intelligence becomes the hegemon, they will embrace pro-democracy reforms if middle class or if both poor and weak. If such a person of average or just below average intelligence becomes the hegemon, and they were born poor but have grown strong-willed, they will adamantly shun pro-democratic reforms. 4. To the fourth type of hegemonic personality, someone who is both of average or below average intelligence and is bipolar. Their lust for learning more about empires and seeking to establish one of their own for themselves stems from being born into poverty in a crumbling empire, where pro-democracy rioters attack the bipolar hegemon's military insulation from their own opposition's economic decay. Such a person, who learns of empire, who is born into poverty and surroundings that are known by all to be an authoritarian dictatorship, and who ends up being the hegemon of their own empire, will not accept any pro-democratic reforms. They will establish a hit list of their enemies. They will enforce their will more directly on the citizens of their empire, by being unlikely to establish a democratic wing of their government, nor to obey the laws of any existing type of such social compact. Such a person who is born poor and bipolar into a crumbling empire will not be capable of establishing or maintaining any form of government that will outlast their own life. All their endeavors result in can only render their prior empire dust.